What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is January 30th of 2023. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, I wanna talk about a major trap that a lot of investors are likely going to get caught in. As we come up on the FOMC meeting this week on Wednesday on February 1st, a lot of people are wondering whether or not we're gonna be able to continue the upward price action we've had or whether or not we're gonna be moving lower. In today's video, I wanna kinda of give a bit of an overview on what my thoughts are as to what's gonna happen in the next coming months. But on top of that as well, we have an interview with Crixivia, one of our long-term project partners here on the Data Dash channel. So stay tuned for it, you guys won't wanna miss it. All right, if you guys enjoyed the video, drop a like and let's go ahead and kick off the rambling here because we've got a lot to uncover. I want to go ahead and talk about one key thing and that is avoiding FOMO within the market. I know a lot of people are really excited about the price action we've seen and I think a lot of people are turning towards this upcoming FOMC meeting as a potential catalyst point to define whether or not we are in a bull market finally or if we are yet again going through another relief rally and are going to continue moving lower right after the FOMC meeting. And I have to tell you guys that I think both of those views are a bit narrow-minded. I'm just gonna be genuinely honest here. I'm not here to insult anyone, but I gotta tell you guys, I don't think it's either or. These FOMC meetings are very big events. They are where the Federal Reserve up on this upcoming Wednesday is going to not only make adjustments to monetary policy, but on top of that as well is going to provide some details and comments that will help the markets understand where its future projections are for future monetary policy and therefore helping us to reprice assets, reprice expectations for earnings, you name it. All right. So again, a lot of people are expecting, I think a growing number of people are expecting the Fed to only do a 25 basis point hike and signal that this may be the last or that we're only gonna get another 25 basis point hike or so. That's at least what some of the prediction markets have been showing us, that generally speaking, that inflation has peaked, the Fed has done its job, and the game is over. And now we can start the next grand awaited bull market. But on the other side of the camp, there are also people who believe that, no, this is going to be a fake out right here and now. And right after the meeting, we're going to hear Jerome Powell lay down the hammer. He's going to send markets going down. And we're going to repeat what happened back in August, where there was a almost direct immediate response to the Fed's comments that the tightening cycle is not over and that we've got a long way to go. Right. I think it's not going to be either of these. I think it's going to be something that's going to continue to feel like it's a bull market at the beginning of the next turn up and that simply we're going to continue to see equities and crypto probably go up to those ranges that will convince everyone that it's the next bull market. All the traditional means that would get us excited, that would get retail traders buying into the market in order to absorb a lot of that buy side pressure and liquidity and trap those traders in order to drive prices lower and absorb a lot of the excess liquidity that's causing inflation in the economy. I'm going to tell you guys about a, a really cold point here that we need to keep in mind. And trust me, this is why Jerome Powell does keep track of equity markets. It's why the Fed watches what's happening financial assets. We need to understand a very important dichotomy here. You know, in the previous video, we talked about deviations. We talked about traps for traders and stuff where, generally speaking, asset prices will go up to that point where everyone is convinced. The general trading credit is convinced that this is it. This is the start of the next bull market. And it just so happens right at that point, that's when institutions start to short. They start building positions to the downside. And through their weight and through their mass on their order size are able to lead towards dramatic moves to the downside and vice versa. If they want the market to go up to a large degree, they'll start making those bets that will have that kind of upward pressure. Right. So we talked about this in the last video. If you guys haven't seen it, I recommend you watch it after this one. It will help to explain some of the topics that we're going to discuss here today. But most importantly, we need to understand what caused inflation here over the past year. Was it, for example, uh, the net worth of Fortune 500 CEOs like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos doubling their net worth on paper? No. That's not what caused inflation. I know a lot of people want to think that, right? Because, oh, you know, the rich, uh, they just keep getting richer and stuff. Look, as much as, yes, I think that is a broader issue, and it does speak to a broader issue in the United States and the global economy, key thing to understand is that Jeff Bezos probably didn't spend more money than he was spending back three or five years ago. Same goes for Elon Musk, same goes for Bill Gates. So where did that inflation come from? Well, it came from a lot of people getting a lot of money for no additional output. 
And I'm not here to insult everyday people. I know a lot of you guys work incredibly hard out there, but that's what caused inflation. The government handing out stimulus checks from quantitative easing, stimulating asset prices, where everyday individuals who had money in their brokerage accounts were able to make five, 10, 20 X returns off of stocks like GameStop, AMC, total Fugazi kind of price action, if you will, referencing back to Wolf of Wall Street. Just complete nonsense where people made a lot of easy money and then have been able to go out and spend in the economy. We have more people now than ever working in jobs that aren't creating goods or services in the economy, being able to make money from financial markets. And this has created a lot of the inflation that we've seen in the economy. It's what led to the spike in 2021. It is a monetary phenomenon, plain and simple. So the key thing here, in order for the Fed to get inflation down long term, they need people to buy into investment assets. This is one of many means to get inflation down. They're not only increasing interest rates, they're not only reducing the balance sheet to tighten and constrict that monetary policy in a forceful manner, but on top of that as well, they need liquidity to get absorbed by institutional investors who aren't going to go spend that money in the economy. That's one of the big dynamics here. If financial markets ease too much and start coming up, that's going to mean more money in the pockets of everyday participants and market retail investors. And they're going to go spend that money promptly in the economy. That does not help inflation. This is a little known dynamic that people do not consider. And how financial assets, while financial wealth is in direct wealth in the economy, if it is in the hands of people who are more likely to spend it, rather than say someone who, let's say, has $100 million, they double their money in the market, are they really gonna be spending more or less than they were before? Is there anything they couldn't buy with 100 million that they now can buy with 200 million? You start to get the gist here, right? The, there is a difference between financial wealth and physical wealth in the economy, money that is spent for goods and services. And that is exactly what happened here. We had a huge wave of demand with a lack of supply, not only due to the supply chain issues and COVID and whatnot, but on top of that as well, we have a labor shortage. We have a, la a lack of people who are willing to fill in those roles and meet that demand in the economy, which means there is too much excess money in the hands of everyday people. Plain and simple, guys. I know that that is something that's a bit painful. Sometimes it can sound like it's, uh, oh, we're blaming the little guy here. No, it's just economics. That's what it is at the end of the day. So we need to understand that the Fed understands this principle here. And until we get to this point where a lot of people start betting, oh my gosh, you know, as we get above the 200 day here on the NASDAQ, and until we get well above, possibly up to the previous points of resistance like we had in May of 2022 and August of 2022, potentially another 300 points or 230 points here on the S&P 500, until the Dow Jones deviates up above this line of resistance, around maybe say 35,000 points, that is when I'm going short. When everyone is convinced that this is the beginning of the next bull market, that this is the time to go along. And as you all know, right, we've been generally bearish. We've been generally betting on the market going down. And yes, Bitcoin has rallied up a decent degree in 2023. But you know what we didn't do and what we advised heavily here on the channel is to not try to short the market. If you tried to short the market, you got squeezed out. And I'm not here to insult anyone, guys, trust me. I've gotten caught in bad long and short trades before. It happens. It's a lesson to be learned from. The important dynamic here is that we've been in cash. We understood that the Fed is on a crusade to cool down inflation, and it will do that. I know a lot of people have been talking about you know the Fed, oh, they're, they're starting to use new metrics to calculate inflation, and therefore they're gonna be able to start easing. Folks, Inflation as a monetary phenomena cannot be ignored. It cannot be circumvented through false metrics, right? I'll put it this way. While the unemployment numbers have definitely been scuffed before, just because we say that there is only 5% unemployment when in reality the number is 10% doesn't make a difference. It doesn't change the reality, the real economic weight of ramifications of unemployment, or in this case, inflation. Right? This is a pure monetary phenomenon. And if we ignore the past couple of years where we have expanded the balance sheet, not us, but the Federal Reserve, expanded the base money supply, still from this point at a 2x from where it was at before, and we don't think that there's still work to be done, we got another thing coming. 
And I write about this in this month's newsletter, right? While we have some positive things helping to knock down inflation from commodity prices like natural gas really cooling down, cutting down people's utility bills as Europe has had a warmer winter than expected. And on top of that, oil sitting here within this channel between the 200 day and 200 week, there are definitely some steps in the right direction. But in this month's newsletter for the Dash Report, we really hit in on this point where we believe that there is going to be a trap set up, that there is going to be this period of elevated price action. It's not going to happen, I think, by the end of this FOMC meeting. I think people are going to come out pretty much unchanged and happy from the FOMC meeting, and things will probably continue higher because the Fed will do what everyone expected, a 25 basis point hike. And equity prices will hang for a while until we finally get the sign that it's nothing but a liquidity trap. It's a distribution pattern for institutional investors, for large stakeholders at Fortune 500 companies to offload into that optimism when retail liquidity is high in order to be the buy side pressure that they can use to sell at an elevated valuation. We've been talking for months about how major CEOs, even people as passionate as they are about their company, like Elon Musk, offloading. It's public record that you can find that these companies and their insiders or their the actual people who work at the companies or large stakeholders they're offloading shares and don't think for a moment that ftx celsius voyager genesis all of these players are not thinking about doing the same with an elevated bitcoin price you guys don't think the exchanges are in on this a little bit I don't know. I got to tell you guys, this doesn't look like a traditional bottom to me in crypto markets. It looks quite artificial. It looks like a liquidity trap. And right when we get above that 200 week over, say, a day or maybe even a week, when everyone is convinced that at 20 something thousand dollars, when every short has been squeezed, when every trader has flipped to being long. Okay, not every trader. I'm being a bit melodramatic here. But a lot of traders have started to switch to being long and are convinced that the Fed has won. The moment we get a CPI report, the moment we get the PCE inflation numbers, some kind of catalyst, some macro indicator that, uh oh, the job is not done. Oil prices spike up, natural gas spikes back up, whatever it may be. Equities start to go down, crypto starts to go down, and you got caught in a liquidity trap. That's the name of the game, guys. It's how institutions operate. They think about what you as a retail trader are going to do, either trading with emotions or the traditional principles of TA. You know, death crosses, golden crosses, all these things that you hear about in the headlines. If you follow those kind of FOMO principles, the market will take advantage of that time and time again. I'll put it this way, um, you know, we've not been against dollar cost averaging here on the channel. We've said to do it passively, but more aggressively when we get capitulation candles. If you were eager to dollar cost average or buy now and you weren't back a couple months ago, that is not the way to trade or invest. It's not the way to DCA or trade the cycles. You got to buy into capitulation. You got to stomach it. You got to buy when no one else wants to. And there's no reason to beat yourself up if you missed the $15,000 price range for Bitcoin, 15500 I got a feeling we're going to get a second retest, if not worse price levels down the line. This bear market is going to play out over a long period of time because it's different from the past few previous bear markets. Inflation is not something to be trifled with. And we've still got a lot of fake valuation in the crypto space when we don't have the same kind of monetary easing and liquidity pressures we had back over the last decade. That's the dynamic that's changed. And the Fed will do everything it can to contract that excess liquidity. Anyways, guys, I've rambled out a good amount here. If you enjoyed the core part of the video, drop a like, and let's go ahead and dive in to this interview with Gus from Crixivia. 
All right, everyone. So in today's sponsored interview, I'm sitting down with a good friend of mine, Gus, who is the COO at one of our partner projects here on the Data Dash channel. And that is no other than Crixivia. They're one of the really interesting play to earn projects that we've been tracking within the crypto space back since as far back as 2022. So it's been nearly a year now since I first found out about Crixivia. Gus, thank you so much for taking the time, man. You guys have had a really successful beta launch. And I'm kind of excited to dive into the project and what you guys are working on. Definitely. Thank, thank you, man. Thank you. First, when I thank you as a team for the support uh, since we started, it has been overwhelming period, I guess, for everyone during the bear market. Uh, but as a team, we took a mission. Uh, we want to build. We want to build this game. And yeah, we're still on it. Well, man, I got to tell you guys, you guys had a really successful launch. I mean, from the metrics that you shared with me, I know we'll talk about that as we go throughout the interview here, but I wanted to just go ahead for those who may not know, I bet people probably heard me mention Crixivia on the channel by now, as we've done a couple mentions on the channel. But for those who may not know, what is Crixivia all about as you know, someone like yourself or myself who's really into gaming? All right, let, let me start by this. I always call it the technical definition. I mean, Kyrgyzivia is a 3D MMORPG game built on Web3, leveraging the blockchain technologies to turn everything in game that you own, that you trade, that you have in game or you mint into NFTs, basically, giving the users ownership and giving uh, the players a way to create uh, earnings or, or, or d driving an economy or, or an income from, from this game. Uh, think of... The other pitch that I always like to do is that think of World of Warcraft, think of RuneScape, but on Web3, the Web3 version of World of Warcraft and RuneScape into uh, into this uh, gaming field. Yeah, and that's one of the big things. Like Many people have probably played one of those titles. If you guys have ever played role-playing games like RuneScape, which was a huge game for me, I wasted. I don't want to say I wasted. I spent countless hours playing RuneScape growing up. And uh, I've played all kinds of different games, but I have to say the one thing that's very unique about role-playing games or MMORPGs is that you not only get to play with such a large player base, they're very scalable games, so you can usually offer them for free, you can run them on a laptop or anything. But on top of that as well, it really allows for this really cool bonding experience where there can be marketplaces and economies. And I exactly. think that whereas maybe you could make some kind of play to earn game in an FPS fashion or different games, really this open world RPG title is where there's a lot of really big potential. And I have to say, you know, one thing that really stood out to me about Crixivia back in 2022, and also just getting to chat with you, Olga, Frederick, some of the team, is that I, I got to see over the past year that you guys were one of the few in the space from the last couple of years during the last bull market who raised capital, who went out and set on a goal to build something. You guys are one of the few projects that actually deployed to market. The game is fun to play. It feels like I'm playing this perfect mix between RuneScape and World of Warcraft, which are two really large titles out there. And on top of that, there is the play to earn mechanism. And it isn't so much uh, that like I'm just doing it for the earning, but I'm really enjoying playing the game as well. Yes. And I think that, it, yeah, I think that's a big element to it. Like it's a game that people want to play. Exactly. And, and that's exactly the point here. I mean, there's, you know, during the bull market, there's always a lot of noise and there is a lot of uh, dreams saying you can play and make full time living from playing games. That's not the target for Crixivia or any play to earn project right now uh, that's launching on Web3. The first layer that all players and we need investors as well to understand is that gaming in general is changing. Everything is going to shift yeah. somehow one way or another into NFTs and to ownership for the players. And why is that? So imagine you as a player in RuneScape, you played for years on RuneScape, but you want to change. You don't want to play anymore on RuneScape. You invested a lot of time. You bought maybe some, a lot of their subscriptions and our purchases. But once you leave, you're leaving as an, as a player, there is no ownership and there is nothing there, but your account and your email yeah. on that game. But imagine in the future, whenever you're playing a game and you want to move from one game to another, there could be some sort of an integration where you can move your character and everything and even some of those NFTs into that other game. That is one sector. Or even you can sell it in the public market for an interested player. And then you can go and start investing in that other game. So it will be a revolving economy between all games because you, you as a player, you sometimes you want to play RuneScape, but sometimes you want to play Apex or, or Call of Duty or, or PUBG. But in each one, you want to, you have to create and you have to invest in that game, and it becomes costly as well for players. So this is this is like what the average player in terms should expect, and that's why Crixivia 
when we started this project and Fred and Antoine are the CTO and the CEO, they started it in January 2021 when the hub, full hype around gaming where Axie was growing and everybody started to launch those games with some sort of bad tokenomics. It would do good when everything is going up, but when we can't survive bad, the bear markets, uh, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. So we lost all their players uh, and the, the, the projects are closing one after the other if because they are dry, getting dry out of cash or the team just chose just let's stop, take whatever is left and let's leave. Uh, our aim was to bring the play that the, you need to enjoy the game. You need to, to dwell into it. You need to spend so much time. And that's where you can create the economy and allow the game to grow. Because as a player, you're not just taking that token, for example, or that NFT, and you just want to sell it right away to create that earning. And it will be like a, a pressure, like the game will not even improve. And you as a player will not be improving because whatever you're earning, you're just, you want to sell it. But as as we launched, and we will get into that into, into details uh, during the call, is that we see that our hypothesis since we launched the beta is coming into effect by bring the really nice game to players, and then just observe the magic of <laughs> of what happens when you bring something that they want to really spend time on and invest in. Yeah. So I think on that point, guys, we we I think we even chatted about just you and I and stuff where. It's the difference between play to earn and playing and earning. Like, you know, you're not doing it just to earn and stuff. Like earning is this additional mechanism, I think not only to incentivize for sure, like people engaging in these virtual worlds, but I, I don't think it's so much an incentive. It's just how it, it should be to a degree. Like, you know, Steam, for example, over the last decade has started to implement this to the marketplace through through games like CSGO, where you'd earn crates, you'd earn these things. And it's like sometimes a couple cents to a dollar or something. But that was a really nice rewarded mechanism. And the reason why is because there's a marketplace out there where people will pay for that. You know, the games sometimes like CSGO are free uh, or Counter-Strike. So this model has, has already been shown to work to a large degree, but I think it can be really like really hyper accelerated when you bring it into a really solid MMORPG game, which I think RuneScape and World of Warcraft have built great worlds, but they haven't tapped into this mechanism yet of utilizing yeah. NFTs, having an in-game currency, having a real circular economy, which again is based around a world that people want to commit their attention to and dedicate a lot of time to. Sometimes unhealthy amount of times, if we're being honest with ourselves, but it's a it's a lot of fun nonetheless. And yeah, I've made some great friends along the way playing some of these games years. But anyways, I wanted to hit on one point us here, which is kind of leaning what you're talking about, about making a game that people want to play. Crixivia had been an alpha for a long period of time. You know, you guys have been building for a lot. You know, one thing I love about Crixivia is the team was never focused so heavily on marketing until something's ready, you know, and then you guys came out strong over the past couple of weeks with the beta launch. You fixed a lot of issues within the game. There's a lot of new features and you guys have been getting a good turnout of players as well. So I was curious, what are the metrics looking like right now? Like how, how have you guys been weighing out versus your expectations for the launch? And on top of that, what are some of the really cool new things that you can do within the beta that you couldn't do in the alpha? Yeah, actually, uh, it, it has been, so speaking about the beta, it has been, um, we, we're very excited and we went over expectations uh, for us as a team uh, in terms of the results of the beta. But I would like to to to, to talk about to emphasize on the point where as a team we didn't uh, put much money into marketing uh, over the uh, past year or since we launched, and that's for the sole reason that we anticipated we saw what's happening in the market. Uh, I myself, before Chris Gisavea, I'm a crypto investor. I'm uh, I'm a startup founder, and I was a VC in San Francisco. Uh, and we've seen bear cycles come in and we know during that bear cycle, whatever mm -hmm. thing you're spending, whatever you are doing, it's just you are burning cash and it's useless cash. For an investor, if if you see an, a project that is pushing marketing to get more investor or to, to, to focus on how their chart is looking like, that project owner is wasting the funds they have and they will run out of cash because you can never expect how long the, the bear market would exactly. last. And during that bear market, VCs will have, dry, they will get into, they will dry their cash out and there's no more money, no new money is going to come into the markets. And we all know that new money will come into the markets when the bull run starts. And what that's where the excitement and the really good projects will win because those are the projects that built during the bear market and are presenting products eventually. And this is exactly where GameFi was lacking in that last bull market. And that's why a lot of projects have failed is that a lot of 
founders, and they are really good founders. I'm not talking about the founders. They were in a rush to launch a product. And launching a game within two, three months, or even six months, you will not be launching a game that is really playable. It's playable, you know? yeah. It's like it's like a demo, you know? Like, that's what exactly. so much of it was at the end of the day, yeah. Exactly. And we, we were betting that after a year or two, uh, since the first GameFi hype, since Axie, Axie was the leader for everyone, there will be time where the real games will be in development. And after one, two years, is this is where games will start to deliver. And we're very proud as Crixivia to be the first project in, uh, on, that launched the first MMORPG Web3 game into the public. Right now, our beta, we're not having, for example, a private beta. It's public. Anybody can go to our website and start playing. And as a team, we had a certain expectation, for example, once we launched, because we even didn't, we weren't planning huge marketing campaigns with it because we know beta, we know that beta has uh, certain bugs that it's in it. And we're following the soft launch approach uh, that major studios uh, focus on, where they put their game out there, uh, do limit just limited campaigns. We did it with uh, GameSwift, which is the largest uh, gaming community in Poland, and another project called First Play, uh, where we were able to get 150 players from the first GameSwift, and we got 100, another 150 players from First Play. However, we did some search engine optimization (SEO) to 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 target those people who always search for MMO free to play games. And that is still getting us on a daily basis, 150 users. Wow. And we are at almost right now, we are at the 2,500 players since January 13th. And that is at $0 cost. This is the strength that, that we have seen. And this is the result that we have seen that is actually overwhelming for us as a team. And it was so much encouraging. So we would put all the time right now and the focus into that. Because once we want to speak with anyone once you want to pitch your project to anyone you, you it's we Xavier, we pitched the video that the first demo that we did and we were in alpha all that time but it was very important for the beta to see how we are able to drive users and user engagement to the game and it's not just about the daily active users and the new users that we've got it's we were focusing as well on the time spent and on the retention and the churn that we we're facing mm -hmm. in the game how to improve those uh, those with the small base that we have because as we optimize here then once we want to start our user acquisition strategy we're not losing players for bugs that we already know about so because exactly. in game you, if you lose one player theoretically and that's proven by all universities is you will pay 3x more to acquire that same user that you acquired for example if you get a user for one dollar and you lose them, you need to spend three dollars in order to convince that user to come back to your right. game, so we want to avoid that. We we know what what is what that the strategy that we've put in is that let's get these users at zero dollar mm. cost. Let's see that the effect that we have on board as much players as we can, and we've seen that our community became the player. So even the investor who, who invested in Crixivia is playing three four hours a day right now. The average time spent per user is between three to four hours. And that's really good. An MMORPG, basically, right? I mean, that's incredible, Gus, to hear that you guys are getting. So I know about the daily active users, but to have a three to four hour average attention span playing the game, I mean, it shows that again, you guys have built something good. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I, I do completely agree with you that that mentality that a lot of projects had that I think is unfortunately led, well, fortunately, I think led to a lot of the downfall, a lot of these projects that had a lot of empty promises. When you just spend on marketing without having a finalized product, as you mentioned, it's not only more expensive, but when the capital dries up, you know, the the emperor has no clothes, so to speak. You, you start to see like which which projects are actually like who are who's here to build like within the space when it comes to the engineering teams. What are the games that people actually want to play and stuff? And then you really start to filter out the noise after about a year of one of these market yeah. cycles. So I think that's why again I really liked Crixivia that it still seemed like there was this building behind the scenes. It wasn't all about marketing and the here and now and catching every trend. It was just about building a quality game. I, I wanted to speak about that though. We'll let you guys have planned for the roadmap because in the beta now, uh, there's a ton of really great features. You guys uh, have made it so that there's a ton of dungeons that you can start to go into even more bosses, more collectible NFTs and items within the game. I think in the alpha, that's where things were kind of cut short, you know, it's just to try the combat system, explore the base world. But now there's a lot of really interesting places you can go to, more things you can do. 
what are maybe a couple things that I might have missed there that are like available in the beta now? And also, what are you guys planning to get into the game going forward, as well as maybe some strategy around Crixivia's ecosystem and, you know, potentially around the token? Exactly. So so since we launched the beta, uh, we have been focused on one strategy. It is find bugs, fix them, launch, and repeat. It's fix bugs, find them, fix repeat so that that was like the strategy for the development team and as we go through this we still have one we estimate we have one to two weeks to to solve all the existing bugs that we found uh, from players from the feedback that we've got and from the testing that we are as well are doing while players are there uh, after that we will start to add the new features we have in game so there are more quests that will be starting to to, to be implemented there is also the duels feature which is a very very popular feature in world of warcraft where there is a map all the players get in and fight with each other they can put wagers like in kxs or an mm -hmm. nft or game currency there and you can play against each other so that bringing more interactivity outside the dungeons and outside the player versus player arena because right now once you play this in the city you can roam around the city you can enter the dungeons and fight the bosses and you can go to the player versus player arena if you if you match with people and you can play one in teams of one three and five uh, and right now we're focusing on how to implement more features that will bring more engagement we already see like that time spent with those features right now between three to four hours so that allowed us to focus on the bug fixes in order to look at the retention and start to retain more players mm. and as we retain more players and the chat box is already live in the game so you can chat with everyone we are going to introduce as well to bring engagement with new users users the voice party into the game and it will be exclusively for the launcher so the voice mechanism where you can go into the city put your headset and and get and speak with people yeah with people randomly you can find anyone and just you can speak it will be like a speaking party we will make rooms as well into the game so that will drive as well more engagement and we have been teasing lately we're gonna add like bears and some monsters were in different areas in the city where you can go and fight them as well so it's not just limited going to be limited to the dungeons or the player versus kind of like player the forest area. or open spaces in world of warcraft yeah yeah, yeah. bring the action into the game and like bring more ownership to the players in the city so there are a lot of places in the city if you get into the city you will see like there are certain places that are already designed as houses and we will start like house sales where you can put on all your uh, inventory instead of putting it in the bank you can put it in your house and you can put your nfts uh, and and show as, as a showroom for other players who, who want to for example get into the game they are new and they are just trying to buy new stuff and this is by the way i would like to mention that the in-game market nft marketplace is still in development that's what's coming in the roadmap however we wanted to test okay how are our gamers engaging with the game so we did an integration with OpenSea, and uh, uh, as as maybe we, you may have mentioned this in the previous news that we are partners with polygon mm -hmm. uh, directly with polygon gaming so that's why we moved from Binance smart chain to ethereum and launching as l2 nft everything nfts is built on the polygon chain because it's proven like the best and in terms of it makes much more sense with the cost of things easy, yeah exactly like it's very low fees in terms for the players and we've seen overwhelming results players there are some players that are selling the boots for 90 dollars and somebody is buying them somebody is minting wow. a weapon and they are selling it for 50 dollars so there are some players that are making revenue right now and that's because there are certain nfts that the team will not sell it in the public market these are nfts that players will mint in game and they will just sell it on that marketplace mm. we make royalties as a team and that that we were happy about cracking the first <laughs> amount of revenue and that was a celebration uh and yeah i mean that 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 is that's basically the roadmap land sales uh, be, transitioning the city into more and more open world launching extensions for the city and extended to become larger and adding them more features that are engaging for for the users over the next this is for like we're talking about q1 q2 maximum the first of q3 this is where you're gonna see all everything that we're talking about coming into into the game i love itself. it i love it guys because not only like it making creek cv a bigger city over time or like a bigger like the core world before you go into like dungeons or specific like player versus npc areas like non-playable characters some kind of boss but on top of that as well, I can already see the combination of proximity chat 
and PvP yeah. coming into the mix and people start trash talking and take it out into the battlefield. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm very excited for that. But I wanted to say one thing as well, like you were hitting as well on guess like this this concept where people are able, you know, really to actually benefit from a lot of the engagement they've had in these games. Like, you know, like if I spent countless, you know, months of my life like I did in RuneScape and I got like mithril armor, I got all this really valuable stuff, I could sell it on the grand exchange within the game and get in-game gold. But that gold wasn't like a real liquid currency that touches the real world. And I think this is where, again, you guys, you've hit pretty good, I think, on the second element I wanted to chat about, which is this idea that you can mint NFTs from your in-game items through Polygon uh, so they can be a real collectible on-chain. But on top of that as well, you earn KSX token as well. So this is one of the core kind of play-to-earn mechanisms where if you defeat bosses, you defeat quests, uh, certain types of in-game objectives, you're able to get KXS. And there is an overall cap supply, but it, the idea is that it will get more difficult over time to earn KXS. So you might defeat the same boss a year or two later and it'll be less KXS. So the earlier you adopt, the better in this sense, if I'm, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So so this is this is where, and this is what we spoke about, you need real games to create real economies. Yeah. And you need to play those games in order to create those economies. And KXS right now is the end game token. So we have the two tokens. KXA is the governance or what we like to call it the studio or the company token. Initial, the main token that we will launch the side chain as well. Sorry, I didn't mention that. So in 2023, we're planning to launch a side chain or partnering. And we're currently in several discussions with several chains where we can leverage their chains. I'm not going to name a lot of them, but let's say, think of what Ronin did for Axie and right. how they running so we're, we're thinking some sort we need to prepare be prepared either to launch our own chain or to partner with a chain where we can as well generate revenue from those fees of the transactions that are happening because this is where the revenue for web3 gaming is going to be generated as volumes for. uh so kxs is the end game token and we're seeing that we're right now we're fine-tuning uh, the tokenomics in the game. So that's, we, we're, we're so data and user driven. So everything that the user is doing in game and the behavior that we're going to is happening in game will allow us to tweak. But right now in general, it's right. All the in game tokens are, ha are inflationary, but we're going to follow a different model than all games moving forward. And we already see like requests that KXS isn't listed anywhere. It's an in game token currency that the users are using. You can, you have to use it in game in order to create the weapon to mm -hmm. wanna, uh, do anything in the game. You are using that KXS and that is going to into a treasury, which right later on we can burn it. We can, we can resell that KXS for new right. players. So we got requests from players saying, okay, I want KXS from day one. How can I buy that KXS? I want this currency. So that will that is where will allow us to be different from other projects is that, okay, we can sell those KXS and that KXS would go directly to the liquidity for the mm -hmm. token so that once users are fil finishing the the season and that's where we're going to be lock locking those tokens for each season so moving forward there will be quarterly seasons for K for for Krixivia. Mm -hmm. uh, and during that season those kxs token will be in game and after the three months whatever is left you can withdraw if you and you do whatever you want with that kxs mm -hmm. uh, and that will help us to have an inflationary and deflationary token at the same time and that will balance out mm. the supply of kxs we're only going to put 20 million kxs pool for all players and if that wasn't consumed we will just add whatever is missing into that pool and just continue and even there are some cases where we expect there could be some seasons where there will be more burn because it, it will be more or less on how we increase the inflation prices for example once right. you want to blacksmith and uh, mint a weapon or improve your weapon and if we see that there is a possibility of an inflation to happen it's like an economy we have a central bank let's raise prices <laughs> <laughs> what's happening right now in the world like inflation is happening think of us as jerome powell of the game and yeah <laughs> but it, that... <laughs> it, it's <laughs> funny you say that guess because that's that's something that happens in world of warcraft like in a lot of other games before like in mmorpgs when they have these big network effects you do have like some need to regulate the monetary policy within the game ironically enough it's amazing like yeah. but it, it it happens just like in real economies which i think is is so fascinating and it's going to be so much more interesting to see 
in the form of like being on blockchain, having NFTs and having this kind of core dual currency system between KXA and KXS. So I think it's it's a very fascinating system. And, and this uh, uh, there's one thing, if we, since we're speaking about KXS, and uh, there's a question that I always get from community, from investors, from everyone. All right. What is KXA and how will it play a role in mm -hmm. uh, for Kixivia and why should, for example, why do you do, do you use a need to own KXA or an investor? KXA is basically solely for investors who are interested to become part of Kixivia as as a whole, because we have a short term, medium term, and long term plan. That because we believe in decentralization and we want to be a fully decentralized uh, uh, gaming studio where even the returns will go back to the investors. So right now in the NFT marketplace or at, as a game, we're going to start to generate, and we already started to generate some revenues in Matic. We started to generate some a week in the uh, upcoming NFT marketplace. We're going to add different currencies in addition to KXS, but we will allow users who minted like really rare ones to, to sell it for a higher price. And we need to do that. So that will generate an income and KXA holders will be getting a piece by staking that token and Make getting sense. returns in real currencies and we're gonna try to give really good aprs as the game is growing and that is a way that is something that we believe very valuable that wasn't available in world of warcraft that is not available from runescape if you are a player in crick you can benefit from the growth of the actual game yeah exactly you're yeah. benefiting from that so you, you that's what the loyalty you want to create that isn't possible before with web2 games and right now web3 is making it possible and that's the whole target behind it kxa today we may not have the utility that all investors wanted but you're investing in an early stage startup early stage company you don't need to look at the outlook what's happening today you need to look okay is it promising what's happening what's going to happen on the short term long term and medium term and how will that evolve into the ecosystem exactly. i mean yeah really all i would care about is like is the game fun and is there a means to monetize? And, and you guys have already showcased that, that there is this means and stuff. And now it's a time about focusing on how do you get organic growth? How do you scale that as much as possible? And when you do need, if you want to eventually, like you said, you can do more marketing efforts, find ways to do solid customer acquisition. But really, like, as you said, focusing on organic growth, what's what are the friction points for users? I think you guys have your eyes on the prize. Like this is like really traditional business principles in the exciting economy of Web3 with the kind of potentials that it offers. I wanted to say though, guys, like, you know, we've talked a lot about the game, what you guys have planned. It's all really exciting. I know that there are a lot of people who have made it to this point here where we're chatting and they're yeah. curious about like how to get started with the game. So like, <laughs> I, I'm curious, like, I mean, I, I know if you guys want to check it out, I'll leave a link down below in the description to Creeksevia's website. It's really simple on how to set up a wallet. You can use MetaMask. You can use, uh, for example, we also have uh, a block wallet as well on one of our previous partners. There's a lot of different kind of Web3 wallet extensions where you can sign into Creeksevia at no cost. You don't even need to have any ETH within your wallet, which is really cool. And from there, you can start testing out playing the game. We did a review back a while ago, which I'll also leave a link down below. But I'm curious, Gus, like if people want to kind of get engaged, maybe what are some of the first things they should do in the game? And for those who may want to learn more from like the KXA side of things or just the overall project, what would be the best place to go to? So the best place to go is right away, www.quickzivia.io, which is our website. Uh, you go there, you can try the game. You have on the WebGL, you don't need to download. You can just try it out. If you like it, you- In your you web browser, it. yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, in your web browser. Uh, you just need, as you said, it's very simple to connect a wallet, uh, to create it, uh, and you don't need to put any money into that wallet. And that address will become your ID in the game or the user that is going to interact with the game. So you don't even, the friction and creating all of that information about yourself, it's not needed. It's Web3 based mm -hmm. uh, and it's free to play. So you play for free, you enjoy your time. Uh, you, you spend as much as you want. And if you like the game, simply download the launcher and, and you will get a much better quality on the launcher than the, the WebGL, that's for sure. Awesome, man. Very cool. If you guys are interested, like I said, uh, definitely check out the core website. I'll have it linked down below in the description so you guys can get a test for it. But guys, thank you, man, for making the time just to chat about this. This was pretty eye-opening to even learn some of the new metrics that you guys are going through as you guys are one of the few projects I'm holding at the moment and stuff. Like, I'm so happy to hear about this. I think it's a very exciting game that you guys are building. And I'm just so keen to get in like the PVP arena and be able to experience some of those new updates coming down the line. But keep at it, man. You guys are doing wonderful work and thanks for making the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, man.